So this is the philosophy of Max Scheller, introduction to the life of Max Scheller. He was a German social and ethical philosopher. He was born in Munich on August 22, uh, 1874. His mother was Jewish and his father a Lutheran. However, he joined the Roman Catholic Church, maybe because of its concept of love, one of the uh, concepts that Max Scheller developed in his philosophy. He studied medicine and philosophy in Munich and in Berlin, and he received his doctorate at Vienna University in 1897, where he taught from 900, the year 900, up to 1906. In 1901, Scheller became a lecturer at the University of Vienna and stayed there until that particular year, 1906. So from 1907 to 1910, he was professor at Munich and met some of the disciples of Husserl. And with their influence, his thinking turned to phenomenology. He became acquainted with expanding phenomenological movement but he kept a notably independent position from, <clears throat> from phenomenology. In 1910, he retired from teaching and retired to Berlin and wrote his major works. In 1917, he joined the German Foreign Office as a diplomat in Geneva and at The Hague. And in 1919, he became professor and chair of philosophy and sociology at the University of Cologne. During this period of productivity, which ended around 1921, he became renowned in Germany and elsewhere for an unusual amount of publications. Perhaps one of the most prolific writers of the phenomenological movement is Max Scheller, second to uh, Edmund Husserl. After that, his fame reached a worldwide proportion documented by the many invitations extended to him to lecture in Paris, in Japan, in Russia, and in the United States. In 1920, he became a pacifist and repudiated the horrors of war and was converted to Roman Catholicism. But about 1924, he turned to a more pantheistic view of man in the world and left Catholicism. In the early 1928, he went to the University of Frankfurt, where he also lectured there. And he died on May 19, 1928. His widow was the devoted curator of thousands of posthumous manuscripts until she passed away in 1969. As a phenomenologist, Scheller sought to discover the essence of mental attitudes and their relation to their objects, something that he will develop in his major work, Der Formalismus. He differed from Husserl in his readiness to assign an independently real status to the objects. Remember that Husserl uh, took uh, objects to be the intentional uh, objects of our consciousness. Now, the development of his thought. The first period of Scheller's thought centered on the incontrovertible value of the individual person and value ethics, centered on the non formal or material ethics, which is opposed to the formal ethics proposed by Immanuel Kant. This position of Max Scheller. It is founded in his major work, the Der Formalismus, or Formalism in Ethics and Non-Formal Ethics of Values, a new attempt toward the foundation of ethical personalism. That's the entire title of his work. In the first part of his value ethics, he established the values, he established that values are correlates of three types of feelings. Feelings in the body, feelings of life, and personal feelings. Moral experience cannot be divorced from feeling values as such. And in the second part, he showed that each person was a unique 
self-value. Personal self-value must be accounted for in all variable, variable moral situations. So here in the first part of his ethics and his their formalismus establish the notion of values values as objects of our emotions of our feelings but in doing that he also criticized the formal ethics of Immanuel Kant and we're going to discuss that later so in the second part of this value ethics he focused on the nature of the person the exemplary persons the nature or the theory of the nature of the person is a new and most interesting analysis. The series was also developing a kind of ethical personalism. It showed that our being a person is the form of our mind and our consciousness. No matter whether the mind and consciousness are understood to be human, divine, or just fictional. He developed his idea of the ideal moral person. However, in the second period of his career, after writing the Der Formalismus, Scheller developed a more comprehensive anthropology that verges on the vitalism and pantheism. And he set out to determine what he called the meta anthropological status of humanity. And this he developed in his work, Man's Place in the Cosmos, or Man's Place in the Universe, which was published in 1928 after his death. So it was published posthumously. Remember that he died around May of that year. Scheller, in that book, which is actually a very, just a very thin, thin book, offered a graduate view of being. In his view, man, God, and the world are one self-becoming cosmic process in absolute time. And this process of self-becoming has two poles, the Geist and the drunk. Geist meaning spirit, and the drunk meaning the life urge. The guys, according to Scheller, is powerless unless it can, its ideas can functionalize with life factors, meaning with material conditions that realize their actual act, their, their actualities. And the one that can provide the guys with power, with vitality, is the drunk. So the drunk is the source of life it is source of vitality but the drunk does not have any direction so it is the guys that provides direction so the guys is the source of direction source of uh the ideas size source of reason but it is powerless does not have any vitality at all the drunk, on the other hand, is a source of vitality, but it does not have any direction at all. But when you combine the two, then you have both vitality and direction. Okay. So, now, Scheller felt a particular kinship to introspective and intuitive philosophers like Blaise Pascal. And it was also, it was actually from Blaise Pascal that he borrowed the notion of reason of the heart or logic the curve which would uh, be very prominent in his articulation of our understanding or feeling of the values so he preferred these introspective and intuitive philosophers more than the abstract theories about morality and god this tendency has become the basis of criticisms against scheller's emotive philosophy that his ethics is emotive. It's based on uh, the emotions, on the feelings. And no, no less than Carol Wittiwa was critical of the philosophy of Max Scheller, although Max Scheller influenced a lot the phenomenology or the way Wittiwa understands phenomenology. 
Of course, there are other all there are other philosophers who have also influenced his view about this, about the intuitive, okay? about uh, the introspective power. Uh, philosophers like Nietzsche, Bergson, and Delphi. So these philosophers also influence this orientation of Max Scheller. Of course, the other philosopher who influenced Max Scheller was Edmund Husserl and Immanuel Kant because he studied Immanuel Kant, although he was critical of the ethics of Immanuel Kant. The other philosophers or thinkers who help Scheller's thinking includes those thinkers in the history of philosophy who demonstrated their phenomenological orientation like St. Augustine and other Oriental philosophers. His other works also showed the result of Kantian and post-Kantian influence. As I mentioned here, their formalismus, although it was a critique of Kant's formal ethics, he nevertheless agreed with Kant on certain points. And we are going to discuss that later. The influence of phenomenology, now especially Husserl, account for Scheller's interest on empirical research and in metaphysics. So those are the important influences in the philosophy of Max Scheller. Now let's go to his methodology. Of course, he strongly emphasized the phenomenological method, which at the time was being formally developed by Husserl. And he also actually outlined this in his Dor Formalismus. He first came in contact with the movement when he moved to the University of Munich in 1907, as we have already mentioned. And there he met some of the students of Husserl. So he was attracted to this movement or to this approach of philosophy. Although he applied the phenomenological method not on epistemology, the way Husserl applied uh, phenomenology, but they applied it to axiology, to ethics, or to values, and to his notion of the human person. Scheller is firmly convinced that phenomenology would bring about basic transformation in our way of conceiving the world and ourselves. And although some consider his thought to be quite unsystematic, Scheller was one of the most insightful and accurately intuitive and brilliant thinkers and writers of the early 20th century. And his works abound with detailed description of the subtle states of consciousness, like sympathy, which he has a, a book on, uh, resentment, love, and joy. So here are some of the important works of Max Scheller on resentment and moral Moral Value Judgment, published in 1912. And then Contributions to the Phenomenology and Theory of Sympathy and of Love in Hate, the following year, 1913. And then his Der Formalismus and Non-Formal Ethics of Values, uh, 1913. Uh, and then Man's Place in Nature or Man's Place in the Cosmos, posthumously published in 1928, and Man in the Age of Equalization, uh, published in 1929. So these last two are posthumously published. Now let's go to his theory of values. And here we are going to zero in on the Der Formalismus. And it would be nice, if it, it, would, it would help if you're going to read at least the first chapter of the Der Formalismus for you to better understand his theory of values. Now, in that book, the Der Formalismus, Scheller explained that one ought to do what one ought to do presupposes a feeling of the value of what ought to be done. Now, this ought is actually the concept of duty of Immanuel Kant. So he's referring to the concept of duty, the categorical imperative of Immanuel Kant. 
And according to Scheller, what we ought to do, our understanding of what of duty, presupposes a feeling of the value of what ought to be done. In other words, the feeling is more primordial than the understanding of the duty. Because for Scheller, even if you know that we ought to do our duties, if you don't have the feeling of the value of that duty, we will never do it. Okay? So it presupposes that we already have a feeling of the duty. Okay? That feeling of the duty is based on our values. Now, he divided the values into five ranks, which are given a priori. So for him, the values are a priori, meaning they don't pass through experience. That fulfills the requirement of Kant that for something to be universal, it must be a priori. So if you apply the idea of a priori, that the universal must be a priori, by saying that values are given a priori, then that means the values are universal. And these values are anchored in our ordo amoris, or the order or logic of the heart, logic the heart. And this logic of the heart is not congruent to the logic based on reason. So aside from the logic of reason, Scheller adds another thing, the logic of the heart. And this, the reason of the heart cannot be understood by reason, by pure reason, by the intellect. Okay? And in this view, Scheller followed the idea of the French philosopher Blaise Pascal and, of course, opposed himself to the ideas or to the position of Immanuel Kant. According to this view, moral acts and deeds are individual. And they originate in an individual's pre-rational preferring of values. Meaning before we can rationalize about values, we already prefer the values. Before we can even understand, before we can even reason out about values, we already have certain preference, tendency for values okay so we got we, we will uh explain that in details in the later part so moral experience lies in the what he calls the call of the hour of the moment in which the a priori rankings among values become individually transparent so in a particular moment we going how we value things will become transparent it will manifest itself no matter how much the order amoris may be distorted by the feelings of resentment of hate and other passions we will go back to this later now let's go to the first part of the derpolismus because in the first part of the derpolismus it is where scheller presented his criticism of kant's formal ethics by the way, when you say non-formal ethics, it means material ethics. Material here per pertains to the non-rational, okay? The non-rational. So the formal is rational. That's the that's the position of Immanuel Kant, okay? Reason, pure reason, practical reason. So it's formal. And the na the non-formal the non-rational uh, is regarded by Kant as empirical or material, okay? So, Scheller develops his theory of values in the realm of the material, in the realm of the non-formal. What is that material, non-formal? In the realm of the emotions, okay? So, Scheller's theory of values and ethics would be in fact incomprehensible 
without taking into consideration his criticisms of Kant's view of ethics. Because in the first part of the Der Formalismus, he was commenting and critiquing the formalism of Immanuel Kant, although he agreed with Kant on certain points. And therefore, the Der Formalismus, in the Der Formalismus, Schaller preoccupied himself with a lengthy criticism of Kant's formal ethics and built much of his own ideas on these or from these criticisms. He said in the early pages of the Der Formalismus, in this work, I can accomplish my task only through revealing Kant's erroneous presuppositions and by replacing them with correct ones. That's how ambitious the project of Scheller is in this uh, work, the Der Formalismus. Scheller, though, agreed with Kant on certain points. First, he agreed with Kant when Kant rejected all ethics of goods and purposes. What is an ethic of goods and purposes? Well, it's a kind of ethics that bases the morality of action or morality itself on purposes. Remember the teleological theories on ethics. So Kant rejected all teleological theories of ethics because this ethics based morality on purposes on uncertain goods. Like for example, you want to be happy. If what you're doing will make you happy, happiness is something good, then your action is ethical. But Kant rejected that kind of ethics. Okay? That he rejected that kind of ethics. And Scheller agreed with Kant in his rejection of this kind of ethics of goods and purposes. So according to Scheller, Kant was correct when he refuted all ethics, starting with the question, what is the highest good? Or what is the final purpose of all our volitional connection? So he agreed with Kant on that point. Kant, he said, was correct in dismissing them as having false basis. So Scheller wrote in the Der Formalismus, and I'm quoting him here, I quote, Kant maintained that whenever we make the goodness or moral depravity of a person, an act, will, a deed, etc., dependent on their relation to a realm of existing goods or evils, posited as real, we make the goodness or depravity of the will dependent on the particular contingent existence of the realm of goods as well as on its experiential knowability. So he agreed with Kant that we cannot base our uh, the, the moral goodness or the moral depravity of a particular act on the basis of a realm of goods. Because this realm of goods is based on experience. And anything that is based on experience or empirical cannot be permanent. It will be changing. And therefore, you cannot base your morality on that. So I agreed with Kant on that point. Kant further added that the moral value of the will would always depend on the way in which it intervened in the maintenance or promotion of this realm of goods. However, since this realm of goods is continually changing in history, because this realm of goods is contingent, it's empirical, the moral value of the will would also be changing. So like for example, let us say, God yet belong to this realm of good. So if we're going to base our, or fame for example, or power for example, but this realm of goods, they keep on changing in history. So that means that the value of the will would also be changing. The destruction of this realm of goods would also mean the dissolution of the idea of the moral 
value. Okay. So with these presuppositions, ethics would be based on sensible experience and therefore it would only be empirical and it will only have inductive validity. And remember that for Kant, validity should be universal. Okay, knowledge should be universal. That's why he said that morality should be based on the moral law. Because the moral law is something that is universal. The moral law is, law is a priori. So the a priori is that which is universal. So if we base our morality on a real of goods that will be changing continuously in history, then morality will also be changing. The same holds true if ethics will be based on purposes, on the end, telos. Any ethics which measures the moral value of the will against the final purpose, like you want to be happy, okay? or you want to be, uh, say, useful, that would necessarily degrade the values of the goods and evil to mere technical values subordinated to that purpose. So Scheller echoes Kant when he wrote, and again I quote, ethics must reject all talk of good and bad purposes. For purposes as such are never good nor bad when considered apart from the value that are to be realized in positing them and apart from the values of the act that posits them. Remember that for Kant, there's only one thing that is good without any qualification, and that is the goodwill. So therefore, we cannot base ethics on any purpose, because these purposes may change. It may be good under certain condition. But remember, but for Kant, the good must be good without any condition. And the only thing that is good without any condition is the goodwill. So on this point, Scheller agreed with Immanuel Kant. Purposes are justifiable only when they will posit, when the will posits or has posited them is good. And the only will that can posit it to be good is the goodwill. What makes a purpose good or bad is not the particular realization of that purpose, but the very positing or the manner or phases in which the purpose has come about. So he agreed with Kant on those points. However, he refuted Kant when Kant assumed that the material or non-formal ethics which is also an ethic of goods and purposes, it, when, when Kant assumed that non-formal ethics is also an ethic of goods and purposes. Because Kant distinguished only formal or non-formal. And he included the non-formal ethics to ethics of goods and purposes. So for Kant, the only thing, the only ethics that is viable and acceptable is a formal ethics. He dismissed the material or non-formal ethics. Kant believed that an ethic preceded by correct methods must exclude a presuppositions of the concept of good and bad in the constitution, not only goods and purposes, but also all the values of non-formal nature. So wholesale, in general, absolutely, Kant rejected all kinds of values of non-formal nature, meaning the values that are not rational and again he called all practical principles which presuppose an object meaning a material of the faculty of desire the desire is emotion 
are the determining ground of the will are without exception empirical and can furnish us no practical loss. And by practical, by material of the practic faculty of desire, I mean an object whose reality is desired. That's from practical reason. So it's Scheller quoting Kant in practical reason. So here, according to Scheller, Kant erroneously assumed that any material or non-formal ethics must necessarily be an ethics of goods and purposes, and that such ethics is empirically inductive and a posteriori, an ethics of success is an ethics that is hedonistic, heteronous, and it is an ethics that is incapable of determining the moral foundation of action and is incapable of furnishing insight into the dignity of the person. So that's the position of Kant, and that is the position that Scheller rejected. So, on the contrary, according to Scheller, the rejection of an ethics of goods or of purposes does not imply a rejection of concrete values. Kant thought that we can or he can exclude from consideration the value which represent themselves in goods. But this would be correct if instead of finding their fulfillment in autonomous value or phenomena, the value concepts were to be abstracted from the goods, or if one could derive them only from actual effects. An ethic of material values does not necessarily presuppose empirical knowledge, because as Scheller would show, how the material values are not known through empirical knowledge, they are also a priori, meaning they are also universal. So, Scheller elevated material values in the same level as ideas, as formal concepts. Because for Kant, you have the concepts, you have the laws, the formal laws, the moral law, universal, and the material values, they are empirical. But according to Scheller, no. The material values are also a priori. They are not empirical. Okay? So Scheller also rejected Kant's identification of the a prioristic with the rational, and the material or non-formal with the sensual or a posteriori. Because for Kant, so this is the rational, this is the formal, and it is a priori. The material or non-formal is a posteriori, empirical. Okay, that's the position of Kant, and Scheller rejected that position. So why Kant believe that a material ethic must refer to the organization of the egotistic drives of human nature as found in in all ethical valuation, Scheller believed otherwise. So he refuted the claim of Kant that only formal ethics avoids the fallacies committed by non-formal or material ethics. So Scheller believed that these fallacies can also be avoided, this egotistic this egotistic valuation can also be avoided by non-formal or material ethics. So now, the main purpose now of Scheller is to show that an ethic of material values, which Kant rejected, by no means leads to the conclusion reached reach by Kant. He developed an ethical theory based on the insight that material values and their hierarchical order form a realm of material a prioristic data 
which is disclosed to us by emotional intuition. So if the, the formal, if the concepts, if the ideas are revealed to us by reason, the values are revealed to us by way of emotional intuition. And Shella also wanted to show that the dichotomy between the sensible and the intelligible, or between the intelligible and the emotional, when it comes to knowledge, is not exhaustive. Because there is a separate realm between the senses and the intellect. There's something between what is perceived by the senses and what is thought by reason. And this separate realm is the realm of feelings. That which is felt. The realm of the emotion. So senses perceive thought or intellect thinks the emotions feel so he developed his ethics based on the emotions based on what is felt and what is felt is the value so the value is the intentional object of our emotion or of our feelings and this is where phenomenology would come in because just like Husserl who developed the idea that the intentional objects objects are the intentional objects, no? uh, the, the eidos are the essential or the intentional objects of our consciousness, for Scheller, the values are the intentional objects of our emotions. So now let's discuss the nature of values. So through the phenomenological approach to ethics and to values in general, Scheller hoped to make the theory of values impervious to the criticisms of relativism and of the behavioral sciences. He wanted this theory, this theory of values immune from the criticisms of Kant. So according to him, many emotions have objective reference, meaning intentional objects. He stressed that the belief that emotions are purely subjective states of consciousness is based on an erroneous description or misanalysis or misunderstanding of their structure People believe that emotion is just a subjective emotional state or states of consciousness. Now, according to Scheller, although some moods do not go beyond themselves, the experience of a value is usually an intentional act which is parallel to perception and conception of ideas. Okay. So in, in perception, we have the material object. In conception, we have the ideas. In the emotion, we have the values. So the object, like for example, the feeling of joy about a good news is an experience which have subjective and objective poles. So joy is not just a subjective state of consciousness. Because there is an objective pole to this emotion. Okay? The object is of that experience is seen as a good thing which instantiates a value. So, for example, you have the feeling of joy because of the good news. Now, what is the good news? Why is it a good news? So the news is something good because it instantiates a value. And the value is the objective pole of your emotional or subjective state. So the emotion or the feeling of joy instantiates a value. Because it's not only the good news that will 
instance, the, the particular value. Okay. So therefore, according to Scheller, there is no, there's such a thing as a cognitive emotions and they point to certain real objects. Cognitive emotions. And of course, this cognitive emotion is not something that is congruent to the cognitive reason. Now, going back to the order amoris or logic of the heart that he borrowed from Blaise Pascal. So, again, in the Dar Formalismus, he disagreed with Kant's identification of the a priori with reason. For Scheller, the a priori extends far beyond the uses of reason. And therefore, he included feeling, the feeling nature of man, within the constitution of the mind and posited what he called emotional a priori. So the mind is not only formal or rational. The mind has an emotional component. So that's where he said uh, that it's connected to what we have already mentioned, that what one ought to do, which is the a priori of reason, presupposes the feeling of the value of one ought to be done. That's the emotional a priori. So there is the formal a priori of duty, and there is the emotional a priori of the value of that duty. Okay? All right. Now, let's move on to the Ordo Amoris. Because this is one very important concept of Max Scheller. And this is where he described how we recognize the value as a priori. So values are a priori, and these are anchored on our, our order amoris, or the order or logic of the heart. And again, as we've said, this is not something that is congruent to the order of reason to the formal part of our mind. And again, as we've said, this is what he borrowed from Blaise Pascal. According to this view, moral acts or deeds are individual and they originate in our own pre-rational preferring of values. Now, what is this pre-rational preferring of values? In the ordinary sense, when we say preferring or preference, it may mean choosing something over something else. Okay? But in Scheller's terminology, when you say preferring, it pertains to a pre-rational act. It's an act that happens prior to making a rational or deliberate choice between one between two or more different things so it when 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 we make a decision or a rational decision we analyze which one will i choose we deliberate we enumerate we think of several reasons why I choose this but in prayer, rational preferring, before you can even think of these things, before you can even deliberate, you already have certain tendency. You already lean towards something before you can even make a choice. So this leaning towards something has already taken place in us even before we make a choice. So we may, for example, lean towards contemporary music over classical music. Before we can even think of why do we like contemporary music over classical music? Or we may prefer a particular color. We prefer, say, color blue over some other colors. Why is that? Well, you can think later on. And that's already the rational, deliberate, you know, choice. Uh, I want blue because 
because of this and that. Or I want red because of this and that. But even before you do that, you already have some leading towards something. So in such cases, we inadvertently experience a drift or propensity towards something rather than something else. So there is a pretty rational preferring of contemporary music over classical music or a, a pretty rational preferring of certain colors over other colors. Now, this leaning towards something may accompany us for a long time or even for our entire life. Or it may take different directions during our middle age or when we grow old. Now, another parallelism. In our visual perception, we do not choose to see the light that makes things visible to us. Rather, our sense of sight possesses a pre-visual tendency or trend towards light, towards what is lit up or bright. There is a pre-visual preference to light rather than darkness. That's pre-visual. And there is also pre-rational. So love is, in the sense, analogous to light. Love has an intrinsic bent towards other higher values than those that were merely given to us, no matter whether or not love will realize them. Okay. So we prefer certain values over other values. Now, the more experience lies in the call of the hour in which the a priori ranking of values becomes individually apparent, no matter how much the order of Morris may be distorted by feelings of resentment, of hate, or other passions. In other words, there is already a pre or an a priori ranking of values. Meaning, it is not the person who ranks these values, but values themselves are already ranked. There is an objective ranking of values. And these values are as follows. The value of the senses, meaning the value of what is pleasant or unpleasant, or maybe what is enjoyable or not enjoyable in the in the physical or bodily sense, the value of life, whether something is noble or common, the value of the spirit, which is divided into two, the aesthetic values of ugly and beautiful, or the value of knowledge, and then the value of religion or the religious values, the value of the holy and the unholy. So if you're going to rank them in ascending order, it will follow this. The lowest would be the value of bodily comfort or the pleasure values. And then higher than the bodily comforts, this the, the value of the senses, would be the pragmatic values of usefulness. These two lower ranks of values are either manageable or calculable and divisible. Excessive cultivation of them, as happens in modern society, disunites people. So this is the lower value. The higher value is the value that contains life values. No? They belong to what is noble in life values, but life values pertinent to courage occur only with persons. And then the highest values, the two highest value ranks, are experienced exclusively in human personal feelings, the value of the spirit and the religious values. Okay, so here the rank of mental values of justice, beauty, and the cognition of truth. So, ranking of values. And then the highest of the value would be the value of the religious feelings, the holy or the unholy. So, for Scheller, the values are already ranked 
there is already a, there is an objective ranking of values. No matter how our feelings or our resentment or hate may distort them. No? Some people who are resentful may think of the value of beauty as lower. Okay? As lower than, for example, the value of, uh, say, uh, usefulness. Okay, or the pleasurable, or let's say we may say justice, the value of justice is, of course, one of the highest values. But some people will say, well, the value of justice is lower than the value, for example, of pleasure or comfort. Okay, all right, now I will stop there if you have some questions. Good afternoon, yes, Alexis. Yes, Alexis. Go ahead. Doc, meron din po ba siyang concept ng ano, ng parang kay Kant na lawgiver? Kasi po, di ba sabi po ninyo, nakarank na po yung mga values. Sino po yung nagrank po ng mga values na yan, Doc? If you think of the lawgiver in, in the context or same as Kant, it does not say that there is this lawgiver. Uh, it's simply that in reality there is these values. Okay. So even Kant does not say that the values are ranked accordingly based on the law giver. Kant only say that there is the moral law, and that's the, the this moral law is the highest of the laws. But as to the lower values, does not say whether where, where it came from. It's part of it's part of reality. Okay, but the values, values are, 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 he does not say that values are created. Values are there. They are, they are part of our human experience. You can only stress that as far as well because humans are created and part of his existence are the values. Then the values must also be created by a higher being. But Scheller would not say that. He simply accepts it as it's part of our experience it's part of human the human reality okay other questions oh dami pala rito okay wait since there is already a pre-established prior rank of values and the agents has already run does it mean if a value are not no uh, it's not about immoral or being moral. Uh, this is not this is not an ethics. This is not an ethics that talks about what is moral or immoral. Okay. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, we are you, you are China. You are mixing things things up. Uh, He's not talking of of moral or immoral here. No? Uh, of course, we, you, he talks about evil. When, when later on you're going to see that if you pre uh, evil would be the preference for a lower value. Okay, but he's not talking of the of immoral in the you know in the what to call this uh, in the Christian sense of being immoral that it's it's a sin. No, uh, it's evil. Meaning, if if there is no congruence, uh, the, if our if if our ranking of values is not congruent, is not in conformity with with the uh, if we with the ranking of values, then there's something evil in it. So there's something negative in it, but not in the in the Christian sense of being a sin. Okay. okay. Other questions? All right. No more.
Now you have one minute to answer if you are listening to my lecture. You have one minute to reply. If you don't reply within one minute, that means you are not following my, my discussion. May kindly take note, take note of those who replied. Thank you, Pondo. Okay, thank you. All right. So that's my way of checking if you are listening to my discussion or not. If you are still here or you just log in. We know some people are dazed. So. Pero 37 kayo. All right, let's continue. Values as intentional objects of feelings. So again, recall the notion of intentional objects of consciousness of Husserl. Okay? So consciousness is always consciousness of something. And the consciousness has intentional objects. Now, Scheller adopted this thesis of Husserl, okay? that the ideal objects of knowledge are independent of the knowing subject. So the ideal objects of knowledge, these are the intentional objects of our consciousness. So Scheller adopted this idea and he applied this to his disclosure of the realm of values. Just as there are intentional objects of knowledge, the ideal objects of knowledge, he contended that there are also intentional objects of feelings. And what are these intentional objects of feelings? The values. Right? So the, the ideal objects of knowledge are a priori, and the values are also a priori. So what are values? These are particular class of ideal objects which are objective, eternal, and immutable. So values are given to us as intentional objects of our feelings just as colors are the, the objects of our visual perception. So concepts are objects of our thoughts. Okay, colors and the other material qualities are the objects of our senses. Values are the objects of our feelings. And just like the concepts, they are objective, eternal, and immutable. So, the modes in which values are knowable to us are beyond the grasp of the intellect. So the intellect grasp our grasp the the eidos, the essence, for example, the ideas. The values are grasped by our feelings. How our feelings are grasped by our emotion is beyond the understanding of the intellect or reason it has its own reason that reason cannot understand so according to scheller just as uh, the ear is blind to color 
Okay? So the intellect is blind to the values. So the emotional aspects of the mind, feelings, referring, loving, hating, willing, because these are the 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 acts, the emotional acts, no? Like in, in the mind has its own acts, the, the intellect rather, the intellect has its own acts. Apprehension, judgment, analyzing, critiquing, you know, disputing, etc. Our the emotional aspects of our minds have also its own acts, feeling, preparing, loving, hating, willing, and so on. And they are not founded upon cognition, but are of an a priori character. In our emotional feeling, we feel something, for example, this or that particular value quality. How, wh why do we prefer this? Why do we feel for this? For the shelter, well, we just, we prefer it, the, the, our emotion has its own reason, but reason, the intellect cannot explain why we prefer this. Of course, later on, you can have your own rational deliberation why you prefer contemporary music over classical music. But according to Scheller, there is a very rational preferring of this. It cannot be explained by reason. Okay? So intentional objects, intentional feeling functions do not need the intermediary of the objectifying acts of the intellect, like representing and judging or analysis, in order to come into immediate contact with their objects. Values, for example, as agreeable, charming, lovely, friendly, etc., in principle are accessible to me without my having to represent them as properties belonging to things or men. Values are not conceptual terms which find their fulfillment in the common properties of things which are the bearers of these values. So, for example, when you say, uh, what is a house? What is your idea of an institution? What is your idea of beauty? Now, when you think of your idea of beauty, then you're going to come up with certain common characteristics. But why do you find this thing beautiful? Can you give an enumeration of common properties of things according to Shallow when you do that? Sometimes you end up empty-handed. Because when you say, I, I find this charming, and then I also find this thing charming, and then I also find this charming, but when you look at these things, they have nothing in common. Okay? Why do you, why do you consider this to be agreeable? And this is agreeable also, and this is agreeable also. Why do you have that feeling you cannot give a reason because it is beyond reason. Okay, beyond reason, meaning it is not within the realm of reason. Okay. So according to Scheller, this show this is shown by the simple fact that it's time we attempt to determine such common properties of what is charming to us or lovely or friendly to us we always end up empty and dead. Even the habitual or even the ethical values or aesthetic values like noble, courageous, honest, beautiful becomes accessible not through a number of defined characteristics. I find this, I find this beautiful. I find this accessible. I, I have a feeling that this is noble. Okay. So that's the point of Shell. Of course, other philosophers are critical of this position, but he has a point here also. So values are independent of our subjective emotional states. What is our subjective emotional states? Like for example, when you are sad, so sadness is an emotional state. But the sadness I feel may involve in me various emotional sentiments. 
So, being brokenhearted, being defiant, being composed, etc. These are our subjective emotional states. Now, the feeling of sadness remains. While my subjective emotional state may change. At one point, I'm sad, so I become brokenhearted. Or I am defiant. Or, yeah, I may be sad, but I'm still composed. Okay. Moreover, the causes must not be confused with emotional with intentional object. The question, for example, why am I angry? Is entirely different from what I feel. So what do you feel is your subjective states. Why am I angry? What is the object of my anger? Anger is the emotion. And what is the object of this anger? It may be something else that represents a particular value. So, I am angry because I was defied. Okay? I, my instructions were not followed. Okay? So, not following instruction causes me to be angry. But what is it in this not following following my order that made me angry? So not obeying instruction, not following, represents a particular value that makes me angry. That becomes the, the object of my anger. Okay? Because it, I, I'm going to be angry not only because somebody defied me or somebody did not follow an instruction I may also be angry because somebody betrayed me so betrayal disobedience they represent a particular value which is the object of my anger okay. so a value phenomena as, as a value phenomena Values are true objects, and they are different from all states of feelings. There's a difference between feeling of sadness, feeling of anger, and the objects that is the and the 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 values that are the objects of my anger or of my sadness. Now, values are independent of their bearers or carriers. What is this bearer or carriers? This are things or relations that Scheller collectively called the goods. The goods are units of value qualities which instantiates, objectifies the value in the real world. The value qualities do not change when these goods, when these bearers change. So, for example, let's use an analogy. Let's talk about the color. This is the color blue. Okay. Now, does the color blue turns red when an object that is blue becomes red? Like, for example, a dress. So dress bears or carries the value, bears the color. So if this dress, which instantiates the color blue, becomes red, so it's now a red dress, does the color blue change into red? No. The color blue remains blue the color red remains red but the dress which instant shapes which is the carrier or the bearer of the colors have changed they now it now carries a different color okay so it's not true that values are affected by their order when their bearers change in value Food is still food. Poison is still poison. 
the value of friendship does not change even when your friend changes so this person who carries the value of friendship becomes your enemy he now insensates not the value of friendship you know it's the value of an enemy friendship did not turn into being unfriendly okay. so goods are value things they are bearers of value for example when you go go in you go inside the church see the altar the altar may carry or may bear certain values it may have aesthetic value because it's very beautiful or it may also bear the value of the holy so the altar is just a bearer of value it can insensate the value of beautiful or the value of the holy no yes so it's like saying ano po di ba na the absence of light is not ano po is not saying na uh, darkness po para pong ganun what do you mean parang maya maya po pala ayusin ko muna yung tanong doc okay all right other questions Okay, let's continue. The a prioristic structure of values. So, Scheller made a distinction between the realm of values and the realm of goods. And his assertion that values are independent of the bearers of values affirmed the correctness of Kant's view that a philosophical theory of values or ethics or even aesthetics must not presuppose things or goods they agree on this they agreed on the sense in, on this point that there is there is a distinction between the realm of values and the realm of goods that instantiate them so for example a particular person may instantiate several values the values of a friend of friendship the values of courage the values of health, the values of holy, the values of intelligence, etc., etc. So there is some independence between the realm of values and the realm of goods that insensate them. Okay. So it does not mean that, for example, the value of the holy turns to be unholy when a holy person becomes unholy. It's just that that person no longer insensates the value of the holy. So that's the a priori thing about this realm of values. Okay. So now the a prioristic relation of values. All values are either positive or negative. Okay. There's no such thing as a neutral value okay there's always a value there's always a set a, a, set, a, a, a quality of worth positive or negative the existence of a positive value is in itself positive the existence of holiness is positive the non-existence of a negative value is also positive so if if, for example, chaos, well, chaos is a negative value. There's no chaos. That's something positive. Okay. The non-existence of positive value and the existence of a negative value is a negative value. Okay. So, nobody's holy. There's no holiness. That's a negative value. It's impossible to evaluate the same value simultaneously as both negative and positive. 
a bearer of value, a, an object may instantiate two values. Okay? Like, for example, a person may, 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 may instantiate both friendship, okay, or love, or instantiate hate. But love and hate cannot be, you know, simultaneous as a value. Good is the value attached to the realization of a positive or higher value. Evil is the value attached to the realization of a negative or a lower value. Okay. Now we're not saying that that is immoral, no, in the in the Christian sense. Okay. So this is in the axiological sense. Right. Now we have already mentioned about the hierarchical order of values. Values constitutes a special domain with their own distinct relation and correlation. And among these, there is an order or rank independent of the realm of values. So we have already talked about the hierarchy of these values. All values are non-formal qualities of contents possessing a determined order of ranks with respect to higher or lower. And this order is independent of the form of being into which values enter, meaning the carriers of their, the carriers or bearers of these values or the goods that instantiates this value. So again, these value modalities are those values revealed by sensory feeling, by vital feeling, by the spirit, and by the holy or holy order religious. So this is the ranking of values of Shell. Well, some people may criticize this ranking of values, but that's how Scheller ordered, rank these values. The next topic will be the exemplar persons. As Scheller said, we, we need to attain a higher moral status. And the vehicle for attaining a higher moral status is an exemplar, meaning a model. So an exemplar is an ideal, but a non-existent model of one of the value ranks. So every value, there is an exemplar, an ideal model that manifests this value. These ideal exemplars manifest themselves in historical role models. Like, for example, in Buddha, Christ, Mohammed, Hannibal, Leonardo, Joan of Arc, etc. They are our, uh, they, they are the historical role models. They manifest the exemplars. The nature of an exemplary person is authentic in being exemplary. The moral effectiveness of exemplary persons reaches all people directly regardless of occupation, vocation, or interest, or even culture. So the origin of becoming good in concrete practice lies in the genuine exemplarity that a particular person exercises on others without deliberately wanting to do so. So for example, consider Christ. We, ex we, we consider him to be exemplary. And he exercises or he exercises a particular influence on us without really wanting to be exemplary. Such exemplarity occurs in living persons. So the living persons are the concrete manifestations of the ideal but non-existent exemplars. Meaning non-existent, well, in the same way that values are out there, a priori, they belong to a different realm. The exemplars also belong to a different realm, but they are manifested in historic in history. So there are also living persons who manifest them. Okay, but of course it it occurs only in outlines of ideal persons, which are embedded in our value feeling. So in other words, for example, you have your own uh, ideal boyfriend or ideal girlfriend 
we exist in that you know in that ideal world of yours but there will be some living concrete people who would somehow manifest this ideal boyfriend or girlfriend okay so there are empirical model persons meaning these are concrete living persons who manifest our ideal and the first concrete empirical model persons are our parents okay so they they become the models for us and then of course our models they they grow meaning they they increase okay so parents okay and some other people can also have a uh, strong exemplary effect on us a teacher a president a prince statesman artist reformer um, an actor perhaps okay, depending on the particular culture it could be the chief of a tribe or our ancestors or wise men masters in different cultures but according to him it is the exemplary holy man who exercises the strongest moral influence in history like for example jesus muhammad buddha and all the other holy men in history and what is common among them is that they did not choose or explicitly will to be exemplary nor were they chosen by those who freely follow them genuine role models or model persons almost automatically set up moral standards for other people to follow so people are drawn towards them and are motivated by their exemplarity no matter how deeply or silently they follow these role models or the holy or moral persons in contrast to the empirical model persons an ideal model person is only an exemplary outline in our mind so like your ideal boyfriend or girlfriend it's just there in our mind in the same way as values do exist at least they are realized in materials or by persons so all these absolute value types do not exist unless their ideal value is realized with concrete persons okay so your ideal boyfriend or girlfriend is just there but it will functionalize if they are you know you have some concrete person to embody them so according to scheller these ideal outlines should functionalize themselves with concrete person now based on the values there are five ideal moral person types the ideal personifications of the aforementioned value ranks so they are the, the highest would be the ideal saint then the ideal genius then lower the ideal hero then the ideal leader of a society or of a civilization and then the absolute master of enjoying sensible pleasures so these are the ideal moral person types and you can think of of course of empirical concrete persons who may functionalize this ideal person moral person types now in the same sense as values are experienced relative to the individual's natures the historical manifestations of ideal person types may vary so for example the ideal hero would have different appearances like for example in joan of art or in alexander the great the ideal artist may vary in a Beethoven or in a Michelangelo and even the ideal saints may vary subject to the choices between uh, them since one can make choices only among the lower uh, sorry uh, but in the uh, it vary depending on the religion but in the latter the founders of religion are not subject to choices between them because 
one can make choices only among the lower types of exemplars. So if a person converts to or otherwise begins to abandon the original faith, now there may be some defection or even betrayal, something that does not occur when one makes a choice among the lower exemplars. Okay. So there are many different, uh, there are different uh, personifications of these ideal types. Okay. Now let's go to the last topic here. The moral person. What is the moral person? Scheller retains Kant's understanding of person as having an absolute value and end in itself. Remember the the second articulation of the categorical imperative. No? Uh, treat the person, whether in you or in others, to be not only as a means but as an end in itself. Okay, So Scheller, as we have said, he was influenced by Kant, retained that idea of a person as having an absolute value. However, he is critical of Kant insofar as Kant grounds the absolute value of the person in the universal category of reason. That's understandable uh, after discussing his criticism of, of, of the formalism of Kant. Now, Scheller describes the person as the concrete unity of acts of different types of nature, concrete unity of acts. So the person is present in each and every act. Now, my person is present in each and every act that I perform. But the person is not reducible to any of one act. Okay? So I am present in all my actions, but my person cannot be reduced in one particular act that I perform. Unity here means a particular style. Particular style of, you know, of acting. A style of executing my action or of being. So every individual will have his or her unique style of loving, of assigning meaning, uh, of willing, of choosing, and necessarily has his own or her own access to the world. And when a person dies, not only is that the style of loving, of assigning, or choosing, thinking is lost, but so is that world, no? His own access to that world, it is also lost. Now, for Scheller, our being a person is the form of our mind and of our consciousness. No matter whether mind and consciousness are understood to be human, divine, or just fictional. So Scheller rejected the notion of a pure consciousness or mind. No, similar uh, like what Husserl uh, stressed or affirmed. So the person is just the form of our mind. Okay? So, uh, the form of a person is indifferent to gender, culture, race, and social station. Okay? So the person manifests itself without reference among men and women, culture, race, social station, etc., among Asian or European, ancient people's culture, American or Asian, etc., etc. Whether rich or poor, it doesn't matter. Okay? The person is different to all this. The existence of the form of our mind, the person, is not also comparable to the existence of a thing. When we ask the existence of a thing, is its being an object to us, personal existence consists only in the execution of mental, volitional, and emotive acts. So as persons, we execute mental acts, volitional acts, emotive acts. So we cannot be reduced to a thing or an object because objects and things do not act mentally, volitionally, or emotionally. So such acts are, for example, that a person is capable of loving, of feeling, thinking, willing, remembering, expecting, hoping, despairing, choosing, etc., etc. Now, 
Also, Scheller contended that the word person cannot be applied to being to a being where we assume animation, egoness, consciousness of existence, or value of the ego. It cannot be applied to man in general. The phenomenological essence of person reveals that although there are seeds of personhood in still undeveloped levels of human beingness, like for example, in the case of children, in the case of imbeciles, it cannot be applied or it can only be applied to a specific level of human existence or a certain kind of man where certain characteristics are already there. So for example, babies. For Scheller, the babies will not be, they, they already have the seeds of personhood, but they cannot be considered to be person yet because they are not capable of this unity of acts. Of course, there are persons because they are already, uh, they have the seeds of personhood, but they cannot be considered person in the full sense of moral personhood. Okay? It's, it's like, yeah, you have to, it's like our notion of the age of maturity, okay? Or age of, like for example, when you reach a particular age, 18 years old, then you are already a full citizen. You can vote, etc., etc., because you already have attained a certain degree of maturity. So something similar to that. Now, the imperative that is given in the value a priori, in the objective ranks of values, is only felt by person. So consequently, persons are the only beings who are ethically responsible. And because every experience is value latent, a person is responsible to love the object or a being of that experience most fully. So for example, in relation to other persons, it's the responsibility of an ethical responsibility of the person to love. So in loving another person, one is called ethically to love even more fully and deeply because the object of that love is a person who has the highest or the absolute value. Now, finally, let's talk about what are the characteristics of a person for Scheller. The person possesses a holy sound mind. So the person is somebody who executes intentional acts that are bound by a unity of sense. Not the unity that we are we talked about a while ago. Person is subscribed only to a certain level of development. So egoness, possession of a soul, consciousness of self, do not make a man a person in the moral sense because you have to perform certain uh, actions, no? The, the emotive, the volitional, and the mental acts. A child or a person coming of age has the ability to experience insight difference between one act and other acts. So if a child can already experience this, then he can consider to be a moral person. So he's able to differentiate and conscious of his ability, of conscious of this ability defines a person. So the question is, what about the imbeciles? Well, the imbeciles, the men retarded, while they have the seeds of personhood, they cannot be considered to be moral persons. So person is restricted to those in whom domination over the lived body appears immediately. He has a master, a mastery of his lived body. And lastly, the concrete subject of all acts of the essence of inner intuition. And therefore for Scheller, the person is only as the concrete unity of acts executed by the person and only in the execution of these acts can a person be considered to be a moral person. But just to clarify, 
man, all men, whether it's a, a baby or an imbecile, they contain the seeds of personhood. Only that because they have not attained a certain degree of moral maturity, then they cannot be considered to be a moral person. Okay, so that concludes my presentation on this topic. This is not the whole of Scheller. We have only discussed what is uh, what he discussed in the their formalism. Was not even whole of it, no, not even whole of it. And um, I already mentioned many of uh, some of the important works of Max Scheller. But I hope that this presentation will help you, uh, you know, uh, you, you've been introduced. No, give you an overview of the philosophy, or at least the philosophy of values of Max Scheller.